because we're acknowledging the life of the people before us. You know, yes, we acknowledge the sadness and the loss and the missing, but we're celebrating their life and we're recognizing that this is an opportunity to bring them into our space. There's teachings that will often say that, you know, for Dia de los Muertos, the veils between the worlds are thinner. In reality, the veils are always thin. Hello, everyone. It's Christine Marie. I'm your host for the Rose Woman Pod, where every week we bring you a little idea or two or five or ten that might create some freedom or some, huh, interesting in our mind, body, spirit, self. And this week is no exception. This is a bonus episode for Day of the Dead. If you're listening on the actual day, November 1st, then I am busy tying up marigolds and making an altar and preparing to welcome people into my home uh, to tell stories about their ancestors, to put a picture of someone who has gone on the altar and share something of a lesson they gave them or something that they really remember or want to pass on so that the reflection on our ancestors is not just beneficial to us, but can benefit the community. But I am not a native. I'm not Mexican. I'm not Latinx in any way. And so in doing this, I really sought out the the whys and the richness of the tradition. Uh, before doing it, I wanted the blessing of someone in the lineage and to understand what we were doing in our creating our modified celebration. Where I live in Northern California, you know, which was Mexican territory until the mid late 1800s, uh, there is still a huge Spanish speaking population, and Day of the Dead is very commonly celebrated. And so it's something that has become normalized for me. But in speaking about it, I wanted to understand it in this larger context of indigenous holistic thinking. So I went out to look for an ally in this. Uh, who could speak to all of us about it, particularly about curanderismo or this indigenous integrated healing approach. And I saw Lisa Martinez's picture and I was like, yes, this is the person. Uh, She is a board certified natural medicine doctor. She's a psychotherapist in the state of Colorado. Uh, She is walking the traditional healing and spiritual path called curanderismo. Uh, which is a multifaceted blend of healing practices that come from indigenous folk medicine from a lot of different places in the Americas. And she's got a lot of things to tell us about her lineage and how to practice it, how to take from it, where where to go. Uh, when I was talking to her about coming on the show, she said it wasn't the typical podcast that she would be invited to do. You know, people who are in this field would say about our pod, which is pretty mainstream women and men, more in the Anglo world, that that they would say, oh, it's not our people, but that her belief is that you should give your medicine and let people find it where you where you can. And so we're really, really lucky to have her on the show. Uh, so we're going to also speak about this in the context of our relationship to death overall. You know, Day of the Dead is a really beautiful practice for being in a normalized relationship to death and dying. And there is a huge movement that's been afoot for a decade or so now in the United States in particular to reclaim our relationship to death as a natural thing. Michael Hebb had that death over dinner, which really became a global phenomenon, actually. Like, let's sit down and talk about what we want, how we want to die, and all of that kind of stuff. And then End of Life is the .org that he's working on with some other people. I think you might have heard Dream Mullick in a prior episode talk a little bit about the relationship to loss and death. But how can we normalize it and celebrate it? So as you're listening to these beautiful ideas expressed by Lisa, see if you can interpret it in the context of your own relationship to death and dying, and also in the context of allowing for mystery. And if you are listening to this on Day of the Dead, consider over dinner tonight inviting a story about one of your ancestors or inviting people at the table to share their stories. All right, with no further ado, Lisa Martinez. Today we're really focusing on curanderismo. What is that? Yeah, curanderismo is really a holistic approach to wellness because we don't separate the body, mind, or spirit. We look at the person um, as a whole and we recognize that when each one of those 
pieces of ourself, whether it be our spirit or our physical body, if any of those are out of balance, it's going to have an impact to our entire being. So it pulls in pieces of uh, herbalism, body work, spiritual work. There's definitely a mental support, mental health pieces in there that are, uh, it's a collective. There's, there's indigenous pieces from the Americas. Uh, there's influences from the Spanish, from Mexico, uh, from Jewish traditions. It's, it's a very blended practice. And it's different from region to region. So it's like a holistic, indigenously evolved approach to healing. Yes. And for you personally, what's your lineage? Can you talk a little bit about lineage and, and who you honor in your work? Yeah. So I was raised in a matrilineal tradition. So a lot of these practices come from our maternal line. Uh, so my family comes from... My grandmother's from New Mexico, and she's been there for generations. Uh, so there's a lot of Spanish, Mexican, and Native American influence there, especially from the great, the eight northern pueblos. And my grandfather comes from the area of Mexico that borders Texas. So that's where a lot of that comes from. It's 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 very blended, and it's actually a beautiful tapestry. When you when you learn from them, when you learn these traditions, you said to me earlier when we were speaking about the importance of sitting with an elder versus just learning it from a book. How was it for you? Like, when did you get your first sense of being a, a healer, and how did it how did it show up and take direction in your life? So it's very interesting with me because I was raised in this practice. This was part of our everyday life. It wasn't something that, you know, we sat down at the kitchen table one day and grandma said, today you're going to have a lesson in, you know, some type of herbalism or something. This was something that she did every day. This was something that we witnessed as part of a lifestyle. And it wasn't until I was much older, I'd already had my son and I was, you know, walking in a day-to-day -day life that I recognized that there was a name for it because we didn't have a name for it. Mm. You know, it was just, again, it was part of our life. And so later when I was introduced to practicing curanderas, I recognized that there was a whole system that could be applied. And that's how it all came to be. And so we don't really acknowledge ourselves in the sense of um, like a healer, we don't call ourselves curanderas. Those are names that are given to us by community uh, as we build relationships with them. So what I loved about what you were just saying was that there are so many people who self-appoint, like out of ego and no humility. They're like, I'm now a shaman. Or, or they go for titles that give them external, industrial, university kind of titles. But the idea that you're elected and named a curandera when the community recognizes you to be such is very beautiful. It's a significant, humbling experience to know that you've showed up for community in such a way that they trust you and that they see that you are there for them because that's what this path is about. It's about community. Yes. All right, so moving from this lineage into the deeper individual lineage of ancestors, I know you do a lot of different kinds of things. I thought I saw that you're working with obsidian and, and things like that. But I really wanted to speak today a little bit about ancestors, particularly in the West or in the United States where people are so mobile. And there's often sort of this, we're always reinventing ourselves. We can start from the out of the clean air with, you know, I, I can just leave my hometown, turn my back and become a different person. But we are made up of our ancestors. And it feels to me like until we do some reckoning there, that not only are we sort of not whole in ourselves, but we're losing a very valuable resource uh, for living better now, a lot of wisdom. So what is the connection, a right connection with ancestors? What does that look like? I think one of the most important pieces of having a right connection with ancestors is recognizing that they come in all shapes and forms and 
there's problematic ancestors and there's solid, beautiful ancestors and there's lineages maybe that we don't want to acknowledge, but we need to. And I feel that, you know, just sitting and coming to terms with all of it and being at peace with it is really some of the first and foremost important steps in all of it. But also recognizing that we have a responsibility to be good ancestors as well. How we live now is going to be looked at at some point, you know, down the road. And so, you know, we are our ancestors' dreams, but also moving forward, somebody's going to be looking back at us also. So how are we walking and how are we improving upon um, with what our ancestors left us? Ah, I love this idea that it goes in both directions. Linear time is not one directional. Yes, you're an ancestor and you, um, and that, that's a beautiful way of living with the future in mind. Can we go back to these problematic ancestors? <laughs> sure. Okay, okay, okay. So I got this problem ancestor and basically their behavior, whatever they learned, they passed to their child who passed it to their child. And unless someone became aware of this adapt adaptation, this unhelpful thing, it'll continue. So what do you do when you're sort of still living out the story uh, that was handed to you through your lineage? Is there a way of, of incorporating that person in your own healing and then also healing backwards in time? Yeah, there, you know, in spiritual practices, that's, yes, that's so much of our work. That is a huge part of our work. And we, we have the very simple practices of doing, well, I call them simple, but they're very deep, the ancestral elevation work that we do. What is that? Ancestor elevation is about intentionally putting into motion a form of amending to some degree, you know, the wrongs that have been done or lifting their spirit, if you will, in a form of saying, yes, we see you, we see that this happened, and we see that you may need some assistance in wherever you are in the spirit realms. Uh, to elevate your spirit so that you can continue to move forward in your spirit journey, in your spirit walk. And so there's different ways to do that. You're, it's kind of begging the question of the realms. You know, the, we didn't really talk about that. So is the, it, like everybody's seen Korra at this point. They all know about the Day of the Dead and that there's a spirit realm. And then after this, after the spirit is forgotten by the people who are living, then it begins to fade away in the spirit realm. That's the popular notion of, of sort of pre and post death realm teachings in American culture. But what is it for you? Like how, how do you see the, the various realms of the living embodied and the spirit realms? Mm, Christine, that's such a big question to be really honest with you because in my practice, there's many realms because we're on a journey. You know, once our spirit leaves the physical body, our teachings talk about nine, nine different realms that we journey through over a period of time uh, before we get to, you know, the final, the final place. And so that final place is, there's a lot to be determined about that in some ways, you know, based on, again, there's regional belief systems and there's different practices around that but the idea of like heaven and and purgatory and and hell and all of those things isn't really how it works um, in my practice it's the first time i've ever heard anything like that nine realms teachings or anything like that so is there a i know it's a complicated question you know how on Reddit they have ELI, ELI five explain like I'm five. <laughs> is there, <laughs> is there an uh, encapsulated way to understand that journey? Well, if, if we were going to put it into like everyday terms, part of this is about experiencing our life uh, through this journey process um, and certain tasks that need to be completed as we get to the next level. There's, there's a lot of symbolism and there's a lot of tasks that are completed in the process. It's like we have work to do in those realms as we journey to the next level. The teachings go really, really deep. Um, and they talk about there's mountains of winds with obsidian blades and there's rivers and 
there's colliding mountains and different things like that that are all symbolic of our inner turmoils emotionally and mentally and also our relationships with others in the living world. Hmm. I love that you talked about this ancestor elevation practice. If I was to try to do something like that at home, how might I approach it? Is there is it something that one can do in a per- personally or do you need to be facilitated? Yeah, it's something that you can do personally that um you know and there's again there's different ways to do it but in Curanderismo, those who have had influences, like Catholic influences or folk Catholic influences, they talk about the elevation novenas. So the different prayers that are done for nine days uh, that are specifically about elevating the soul of an individual. If you take away any of the Catholic influence and just take it into a strictly spiritual place, Um, Sometimes we actually go through the physical effort, the physical work of elevating the representation of our ancestors. So it may be a picture in a glass of water uh, where you would lift these these items higher and higher into different places in your home um, until you get to the highest place of your home. And you will do that over the course of nine days or, again, depending on your practice or the region or or what tradition um, you follow, there's variations to that. But ultimately what you're doing is acknowledging them and doing and putting in effort collectively with source greater than you to lift their spirit from wherever heaviness it may be. And I, I imagine that's working on multiple dimensions, like inside of you, just the very act of having this clarity of intention is also kind of releasing it and making space in your own body. And then you're also working in the other realm simultaneously. So it's it's receiving for not just for the self alone, but for the group of the family and everything else, but it should drive personal benefit. So what are some other ancestor practices looking backwards? And then we can talk about being a good ancestor to your uh, progeny. Um, what are some other practices? Do you do you practice uh, Dia de los Muertes personally? Is that something you and your family and lineage do? Yes, we do. And so there's different forms. Again, you know, a lot of times, you know, Dia de los Muertos is something that is often very misunderstood by individuals who look and see that we are taking time to celebrate, if you will. Sometimes there's music, sometimes there's there's food, because we're acknowledging the life of the people before us. You know, yes, we we acknowledge the sadness and the loss and the missing, but we're celebrating their life and we're recognizing that this is an opportunity to bring them into our space. There's teachings that will often say that you know, for Dia de los Muertos, the, the veils between the worlds are thinner. In reality, the veils are always thin. But the veils between those worlds are always thin. It's just when we choose to acknowledge them as during, you know, this time frame is a specific time set aside for us to build our altars, to set aside our ofrendas, to put, you know, certain, there's very specific items that we put on our altars. Each of them has very deep meanings. Um, So understanding those is really important. There's different tiers to the various altars, depending on which region you're from. Some people will go to the cemeteries and set their velas, set their lights, and put out beautiful flowers and beautiful feasts, and they'll sit there all night. Uh, But yeah, it's very much a part of our practice. And we have an opportunity uh, again this year to put up a community altar at Ritual Craft, which we're really excited for. And I say we, um, my son and I have have done that for, uh, we did it a couple of years ago last year. Of course, COVID came and so we, we couldn't, but this year we'll be, we'll be doing that. What does that entail? What, is, what does it look like to set up a community altar? What do you put on it? How do you set it up? Uh, we build tiers. We like to make it very large because we like for a community to come and leave offerings. And so there's the Simpasuchil, which is the marigold. Uh, we put all over 
There is uh, pan de muerto, so a very special bread that is made at this time of the year with orange essence in it that's delightful, uh, that brings us the joy of life. There's always salt on our altar to, to balance the energies. There's always water because it's the conduit for spirit. Uh, but also we want to give them a refreshing beverage in their journey to come visit us. Uh, we always have the papel picado, the cutout papers. That's a way for us to acknowledge the element of the wind, but also to recognize the arrival of our ancestors as they come in. You know, the paper will flow. There's candles. There's uh, ofrendas, the offerings of tobacco, cigars. Um, some people will leave alcohol, coffee, uh, the atole, the blue corn, um, whatever type of food that you would normally enjoy, tamales, uh, carne asada, all of that will come forward uh, to the altar and different toys and candy and different things of that nature. So it's just so incredible to see community come together for those days um, and and sit with and be with their spirits, with their ancestors for that period of time. Do you tell stories about the people who have gone? Absolutely. Yeah, that's that's one of the best parts. Yeah. <laughs> the remember when, the remember when, we, you know. <laughs> remember when. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's the best part. So it's also a time to reinforce the oral tradition, as you say, telling the stories of people and what you remember about them and sort of lessons from beautiful. So would it be appropriate or how could a person who's not in that tradition naturally do these practices appropriately without being culturally offensive? I think, you know, we talk about this quite a lot in our communities. And I think learning from the, the people closest to the root of the tradition is going to be one of the most important pieces is going to the people who practice this and understanding, you know, how this tradition came to be? How long has it been in existence? How many literal thousands of years has this been in practice? What does it mean? What do all of these things mean? And and the, everything from the elements and the colors to the food, and then and recognizing that you're a guest at that table, that you're a guest, and to be reciprocal, you know, for the people that share and honor them in an appropriate way, do an exchange that's appropriate. And always give credit to them uh, if you choose to do this privately in your home. Give and teach to the people who you are sharing this with where you learned it from so that that lineage is always given proper acknowledgments for days to come. You know, it's gifted to you. And, and the way that we keep that alive is by proper acknowledgments. Thank you. I think there is a similar um, lineage. You told me about a colleague of yours who's doing Nordic practices. And I think in Samhain, in the Gaelic traditions, that there was something around this time of year also, which got converted by the church into Toussaint or All Saints Day. As you look back thousands of years, there's more commonalities in when and how people would celebrate and what they would demarcate. It got a little bit speciated with nation states, and but I'm excited to see it coming back. And I've lived in Northern California for a long time, which is about 50% Spanish speaking, and uh, particularly in the rural areas up here uh, that I live in, the altars are magnificent. Like if you imagine a school auditorium for people who aren't visually with, here with us and that stage that you would have in an elementary school auditorium, because sometimes that big of a table and then just piled up with, but, but not a lot of explanation on what it meant. So thank you for that. If I wanted to connect with a particular ancestor, you say the veil is thin all the time. Um, do you cross over and talk to spirits and bring them into dialogue or listen on behalf of uh, of an inquiring person? I don't intentionally do that. That is not intentionally part of my practice. Like some people will call themselves a medium, if you will, that will that's that they sign they talk they sign up for that. Um, I experience that on occasion when I'm working with individuals. 
but no, I don't, I don't go <laughs> deliberately go, don't, go hunting. No, not no, deliberately. Don't mess no. with that. <laughs> no. no, it happens very organically. And, and when necessary, I have rules in place for my experiences that say, <laughs> Oh my gosh, I want to ask you about that. What's the, what are these rules? So basically the rules are, I don't want to chat with anyone on the other, the other realms, unless it's necessary. So if you feel like, if they feel that it's absolutely necessary and it's necessary for the person that I'm working with, then we can have that conversation. <laughs> Otherwise I'm not into party lines. <laughs> oh my gosh. Talk to them directly. Yeah. <laughs> oh, beautiful. Well, we just spoke quite a bit about our relationship to death. And I wondered for a moment there, like how that healthy relationship to the dead and the dying that honors their life and remembers them joyfully on and on, not just at a funeral for like a week or whatever, but how not having that is tied to this fear of death that people walk around and live their life with in the West. You know, that there's something about having rituals around honoring the dead on an ongoing basis that seem that they would change your relationship with death as you live for your own self and limit the fear of that. Um, because I feel like there's a lot of grasping. Like, I just, I just don't want to die. I don't want to think about dying. We spend like 80% of our healthcare dollars in the last eight months of life. You know, it's just a really, it, it feels like we've got a really um, stuffed up relationship to death and dying. We do. And so I thought maybe you could speak a little bit about, about that and changing that. Yeah, you know, it, I honestly have had to work to understand exactly what you're talking about. Because I was not raised in that cultural mindset. Mm. So when I witnessed this in people, it was really hard for me to, to really understand what the problem was, you know, because we were raised in a culture that our wakes were 24 hours a day for however long it took with, you know, the, the person in the casket in our space. So it was very much front and center. We were part of uh, a person's dying experience day in and day out as they crossed over. We were there to help them. That was, since I was a child, that was completely normal and part of our life to sit with them and watch our elders die and be with them on this journey. And so, you know, to be afraid of death was was so so strange to me because it's just to us it's a, our other life mm. it is our other life you know the to to die is to awaken and to heal when we talk about healing we talk about healing being complicated you know we heal unto life and we heal unto death is what one of my teachers taught us that's a very profound statement it is profound yeah let's let's just sit on it for a second I mean, the idea that healing doesn't mean necessarily a wholeness in this physical body, but can be a healing of the spirit in, and, and it doesn't really matter as much the physical outcome is a pretty mind-blowing idea. Can you, can you, what, does it, what does it mean to you? Unpack that a little bit more for us. What does it mean to heal unto death? Well, when we look at it from you know, a lot of the indigenous mindset, we recognize that Oftentimes, it's our spirit that is suffering because we are not our physical body. We're the spirit that's within it. So if the body is struggling and not rising to the occasion, so to speak, for whatever reason, the ailments, you know, the difficulties, the complexities of, of life in this body, and our spirit is released from that, we go on to experience that freedom we go on to be released from this difficulty. So that healing now takes on this new form without this physical, you know, binding physical vehicle that keeps us confined to this reality. I'm, I'm, it's so interesting because on the one hand, I had Jane Metcalf on who founded Wired Magazine and this thing called Neo Life, And I got a newsletter from her today, which is all about anti-aging drugs. <laughs> <laughs> look at that face you guys can't see her face she just made a face <laughs> she made like a scary jack-o-lantern frown 
woo, <laughs> no, I don't, no. <laughs> like anti-aging drugs, or like there's a guy who's trying to upload his brain before he dies to store the contents of his brain, and um, you know, I'm Silicon Valley is a spit away, so you do have an entire industry that's geared at never aging, longevity science, like living to 140, and then if you can't live, then uploading your brain and all your memories so they can be accessed forever and ever. And uh, it just sounds like it's the opposite land of the world that you're living yeah, in. Yeah. Like you're, if you don't believe this is all there is, then you would just keep, you know, you just roll through these nine realms quite happily, living your life, trusting that what needed to stay with your descendants would stay with your descendants and what, yeah. what could be thrown away as detritus would be thrown away. There's such a, a lack of faith in that approach, I think. Yeah. That, I mean, I'm looking, yeah, my face was kind of a shock and <laughs> it's like, why, why we have, we live on through those that we leave behind. That's, that's part of what we're going, you know, being that good ancestor is making sure that we leave them with what they need so that our legacy, our lineage, our teachings, our beliefs, our practice, our love, our prayers carry on through them. Yes, they're a continuation. Like, I'm not me. I'm a continuation of my mother and father, and all my children are a continuation of me. I love seeing myself in that chain. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So relaxing into it and relaxing into age and relaxing into dying. Um, and kind of enjoying the whole thing because it's not the end. Love that. So there were a couple other modalities that you mentioned in your work. And I wonder if we might speak like right now, would this be considered heart to heart conversation, platica, or what is that <laughs> Yeah, as a healing method? Yeah. Is that, is that the Corandera way of saying see a therapist or is there more to it? <laughs> yeah. Sometimes there are people who do <laughs> uh, counseling work where specifically they just they focus on talk therapy or uh, the platica, the heart to heart conversation. But in my work, platica is specific to building a trusting relationship where you allow me to uh, participate with you on your journey. I get to know your story and the pieces of you that you want to focus on as we move together in our session work. And so, platica is really seeing each other heart to heart and making that connection because that is part of how we build those bridges of healing by being able to see one another. Mm, that's the starting point. And see energetically, mm -hmm. which is easier in person, I think. For me, it's easier in person, but I think we can do a little bit energetically even over the video. Mm -hmm. And then another one was Limpia. What is that? The spiritual cleansing. I love limpias. I love, love limpias because I think that we, as people who walk amongst other people, forget or don't give enough weight to the idea that we can just pick up stuff from each other and from our environments. It's just normal. I mean, we're living beings energetically, you know, we have. Um, this electric highway that goes on in our body, it's very magnetic and just very much like a magnet you run through the earth, it's going to pick up particles, right? And so we go to the grocery store, we go to our day of, you know, wherever we work, we are around our families and we just pick stuff up. And also experiences can create, you know, energetic slime that kind of gets all over us. And so spiritual Olympias allow us to get rid of all of that and cleanse ourselves and deeper, you know, get rid of the burden, the weight of all of that. And there's so many different ways to do limpias, you know, often various curanderos or curanderas will have their own favorite way that they like to do them. And they're incredibly powerful, even though they appear to be very simple uh, in some ways, you know, it's, it's almost, it's almost surprising how easy they are. And yet they're so, so powerful in the way that we think, the way that we feel physically, emotionally, uh, and other ways that allows us to move forward free from that baggage. Mm. What does it look like? What would a session like that be? So there's a couple of different ones uh, that we like to do when we're doing large community events is 
the egg limpia, where we use an egg, an actual like not hard boiled, but raw egg that we will intentionally move across the body. Many of us will say a form of prayer while we're doing that. Another one is uh, we will do a sweeping with different herbs, uh, a variety of herbs like uh, rosemary, rue, bay laurel, eucalyptus. Maybe we'll use flowers. Some of us will use the kopal, the smoke, where we do a cleansing with the smoke that way. Or in some cases, you'll see uh, an alcohol of sorts used either in Agua Florida or in some of the traditions, we'll use a clear alcohol like a tequila or even a, toba- and a tobacco smoke in addition to that. The idea being that when we're doing this work is that we're penetrating the, la- the energetic layers of your body to release all of this caca, this slime <laughs> that has, has gotten on you, either because of an experience or um, just by daily life, you know. And there's there's a lot of different influences that can attach to us. Well, in the tradition, I've been studying the East Indian traditions, sort of Asian traditions for 20 years, and they use uh, all kinds of scent as well, Palo Santo and similar idea. So does the Catholic Church. One time I was, <laughs> I, I was, I was raised Catholic. Well, until my mom died. And then um, I didn't really ever go back until I had gone through yoga and meditation training, and I was invited to go for my great aunt Ethel's funeral. And um, they asked me to give a talk, and it was a formal mass. And after being in yoga practice, I, I saw for the first time that when you got down on your knees in those pews and you sat back and went like this, you were doing like a heart opening posture, and that the priests were chanting and they were chanting mantra which is a way of accessing and opening the channels. And they were smudging the whole room with smoke in a thing. And that they were having a whole different experience as practitioners of being in the Holy Spirit Mm -hmm. than I was having sitting there in the pews, not knowing what was going on. Mm -hmm. And then coming back and seeing it with a more integrated feeling tone, like all that stuff kind of works. Mm -hmm. Um, And if you're, if you're, practicing it not just being a consumer (laughs) yeah you know so how do you not be like a spiritual consumer but a spiritual practitioner in a world where you know we've we've got this we're at a very strange time in spiritual religious history in the west like in the you've got like people who are very extreme dogmatic religious and people who are very uh, atheistic and prisoners to material reality even though they know that in their 80 year lifespan, they'll never understand like a 400 million year cycle of planet earth. And then there's this sort of mass in the middle that's kind of like probing and finding and feeling their way away from the harm the dogmas have done. And without the absence of the, the, the void that's created when you believe in nothing other than what you can see and touch, you know? And so as you're speaking, as people, I guess what I'm saying is you're speaking, people go out and, grab onto different pieces that seem uh, authentic, that seem useful, and but they do it like a consumer. Like, I'm gonna pick this piece from here and this piece from here, versus like dropping in and dwelling and settling into the body and feeling what these traditions and these practices do in the self. So um, I don't know why I went off on that whole sideline, but spiritual consumerism and true practices that can get you connected are very different. They are. I'm actually glad you brought it up because it's so problematic. It's so problematic in so many of the traditions because, you know, one of the things that we talk about in Curanderismo is that, you know, this is a way of life that is not easy. It is hard. And you do a lot alone because we're here to serve community. There's a saying in our tradition that says, there are families grieve when we start to walk the red road, when we start to walk the road of curanderismo, because they know that we will be away helping community, that we will be away serving the mother who has lost her child, the father who has, you know, lost a friend, the the people who are sick, the people who are poor, the people who are struggling. And in doing so, 
we are healing ourselves, we're healing our communities, we're healing our families. And that's this work. And there's nothing polite, pretty, fluffy, glamorous about it. And it's not for the light of heart. And so if you think that you can go to a little curanderismo webinar, if you think that you can pick up a book and you think that you can, you know, obtain some of the information there and then move forward and go off to be helpful to community, that's not where it's at. This work takes so much commitment and so much time and really shedding of some of your inner most pain and difficulty in order to be able to move forward. And when you come to those practices with the idea of being a consumer, you're in trouble. I'm envisioning that like when you're saying walk the red road, I just got very teary at this idea of you have to sit in the fire of a lot of discomfort from a lot of people's pain and suffering and be able to hold it and move it through your own body. And I was wondering sort of how, who do you lean into? We talk about that a lot in our circles. And so we, we have, as practitioners, we have confidants, we have elders that we sit with. We have what we call comadres, you know, our sister, teacher, auntie, grandmother, friend who we make phone calls to. We usually have our own practitioner as well, a trusted confidant that we can go to uh, to help us work through it. But we also have to have really, really good self-care practices, really good self-care practices. And I'm going to tell you, if you don't, you're going to (laughs) learn because you feel it. You feel it. And so you learn to also create really good boundaries. Mm. Well, on that note, self-care, boundaries, the preparation to do the hard work, almost anything worth doing and meaningful in the world requires some kind of hard work, meaning into one another, being both an ancestor and a descendant in a healthy and integrated way, not being afraid of dying and accepting it as just another stage on the spirit's journey. We've covered a lot of territory. My community, I mean, it's mostly women 40 to 60, Um, you know, some younger women also. And now I'm getting more men, but I really want to serve this hunger in people to find ritual. I even have a new book coming out in a couple of weeks called Reverence, Ritual in Everyday Life. Oh, nice. And it's, it's really like about reconnecting with a reverent way of walking in the world. And that no matter what you're doing, if you're running a company or you're exploring your embodiment or, or you're parenting, you know, that if you're going at a pace where you can't be amazed by the fact that you, uh, of all of creation, you might want to reconsider. It, the book is very bright and shiny. It's very, very like um, a glitter witch, like a casual witch. But it's <laughs> yeah. just enough of a taste of what ritual can do without being scary. That's awesome. And that's what I wanted to bring in, you know, like, hey, you know, bring in, create an altar in your home, like pause every day and say thank you, create a morning ritual where you're just doing something to acknowledge that there's something bigger than you. And for the non-churched and the people who don't have community, everybody I know is a mongrel. I don't know, most of the people can't speak to their lineage. One of my boys is having a rebirth as a Viking. You know, he's tapped into his Nordic heritage and he's found by d- diving into those traditions, all kinds of things that resonate with him and his body. Kedrick is one of our coolest teachers at Ritual Craft. He is so awesome. He talks about like sacred anger and wow. they do the chants and they do. Yeah, he's straight amazing. So I would love it if you would check out some of the classes that Lisa's offering and take her advice as you dig in to honor the lineage of whatever you're learning and go deep and see what it actually feels like in your body so that you can live an integrated mind body spirit experience uh, while you have the chance thank you so much thank you christine i appreciate this so much well i am grateful for you exactly as you have been born a continuation of your ancestors with your unique spirit Thank you for joining me today. I'd love to know if you're doing a Day of the Dead celebration or if this impacted you in any way. Please come and find me on Instagram at the.rose.woman and send me a note, send me a picture, 
or of something that you experienced or that you'd like to share about your community. Also, I have a new book coming out, Reverence, Creating Ritual in Daily Life. It's coming out in November. I would be very honored if you would purchase a copy and try to create some more ritual in your own life. You can find that at rosewoman.com. All right, everybody. Have a great week. See you next time.